Yes, thanks, Chris. And um, good afternoon, everybody. And, and thank you. Thank you. Welcome. And thank you for taking the time to join us this afternoon. As Chris said, I'm Simon Parkinson. I'm the chief executive of the WEA. And this afternoon's webinar is, is part of the WEA's contribution to Lifelong Learning Week. I think those who will have followed it all week, or you know, I'm sure you'll agree with me that the Festival for Learning team and the guys at the Learning and Work Institute have done a, a fantastic job to pull a week long um, program of events together in really difficult and, and challenging times. So, you know, well done to, to everybody involved in that. I don't think I need to tell anybody on this call that, you know, the WEA believe passionately in the importance of lifelong learning and the difference it can make to individuals and communities. You know, we've been doing that for over 115 years. And I don't think it's too much of an exaggeration to say that potentially our work today is as important as it's ever been. You know, we all know on this call the value of lifelong learning and the absolute positive impact it can make on the economic and the social recovery that we all want to see. So I hope you enjoy this afternoon's webinar. I'm going to just briefly introduce our, our first speaker and then briefly introduce the, the speakers after that. So we're delighted that Tony Breslin can join us and, and kick off this afternoon's session. Tony's a well-known media commentator, a strong author on all things education, and has got um, an upcoming book coming out, I think, Tony, Lessons from Lockdown, The Educational yeah. Legacy of, of COVID-19, probably available in all virtual bookshops, I would say, from, from February and leading brands. And I guess appropriately enough as well, Tony's hot-footed it back from the school run to, to be with us this afternoon. So thank you for doing that, Tony, and I'll hand straight over to you. It's uh, it's great to be here. And in my sort of dashing in, what I've done is put my phone down somewhere in this room without putting it on silent. Um, and I can't find it. So, uh, but I'm not going to take a call if it comes and I can silence it on this. So uh, how's that for a competent introduction? I've, I've just undone all the nice words that Simon has said about us. Uh, anyway, um, I think we've got seven minutes. That's clearly now six. I just want to share some principles but I want to start by saying the thing that really excites me about this is that we are talking about lifelong learning as something that is lifelong and perhaps life-wide in all aspects of our lives. Uh, something that's lifelong and includes schooling, not something that only starts when we're adults, follows schooling and spend much, spends much of its time kind of putting schooling right. Um, it seems to me that we, we need to think of the lifelongness in that, because I think that changes the purpose of schooling. If we want schools to really uh, uh, prepare our children to be lifelong, life-wide learners, I think we're asking them to do a much more exciting thing, uh, but a rather different thing than maybe we've asked them in the past. So here's my 12 principles. Now, Dan, I suspect about four minutes. Um, uh, I'll know because I, I'm, presume I'll just be muted and rightly so. The first one is that the children who are joining, I say this as a, a primary chair of governors, the children who are joining our reception classes this year, most of them will find their careers, by the way they'll all have multiple of those, not singular of those, they will find their careers in industries that don't yet exist, making goods and services that haven't yet been thought of and things that we absolutely don't know we need, but we will swear we need then. And if you doubt that, just look at the smartphone in your pocket, because something like 12 years ago just didn't exist. So how do you, how do you prepare people as learners for a world with that level of change? Second, I've said it already, schooling's not a precursor to our lifelong learning journey. It's a part of it. Um, third, um, we have to play our not just of schooling, but of learning in, in general, the social and community functions of learning. Uh, we have to get away from a narrow instrumentalism that if, if there isn't a job immediately out of it, it ain't worth doing. Um, fourth principle, good grades are important, but they're wholly insufficient. I say they're important because I went to a school where four of us got five A to C grades. Um, and not getting those grades had a dramatic impact on my friend's life chances. Um, but actually, grades are not enough. 
um, and they mustn't take over. Uh, sixth principle, uh, fifth, sorry, 10 GCSEs, the standard school offer, or eight, nine, 10, does not equal educational breadth. Say this to former chief examiner, it's eight, nine or 10 variations on a theme. We need different types of learning during the schooling period if we're to prepare learners to embrace lifelong life-wide learning. The curriculum, I'm on number six, I'm halfway, it's not looking good. Uh, the curriculum is a statement of what we believe is sufficiently important to pass on to the next generation. It says what we think matters as a society. And, and that's why the citizenship educator in me would say, so why don't we spend more time on political literacy and community engagement and so forth? Uh, but we've probably all got our favourites there. I want to suggest, and this is particularly in light of uh, lockdown, the obsession with coverage and catch up can inhibit the, develop of a, the development of a culture of learning uh, and a culture of learning that has a proper concern for well-being. Because without well-being, without inclusion, there is no learning. There is no attainment without inclusion. Um, and so maybe we need to think that way round. Um, we need to think seriously about if we have one objective in the school years to develop a love of learning. And if we then develop a capacity for it, that'd be great too. But if we don't develop the love of learning, the appetite for learning in the beginning, it's really hard to retrofit later. Uh, and, you know, just look at the way young children, run. I'm a secondary practitioner by, by background with bits of FE, just look at the way children run into primary school. Um, that doesn't happen enough, does it? Um, that was an alarm from a phone going off the hook here. Um, so, uh, you know, let's, let's uh, really, um, think about how we develop a love for learning. Uh, I've said this already, learning in adulthood has to build on schooling, not simply be a corrective to it. Um, I think we have to rethink the whole education, employment, work hard and get on contract. We have to revisit it because work is not gonna play the part in our children's lives that it's played in ours. Uh, and we won't necessarily uh, label that as unemployment or underemployment. It will be different ways of operating and living. And if we hold out the promise, if only you work hard at school, everything will be okay career-wise, I don't think that works. I want to suggest that actually education becomes more important if more of us are not going to work rather than if we are. Because if I'm not going to be spending my time working, I want to be exploring culture, reading, understanding things, broadening my mind. So when people say to me, it's such a waste, she's a graduate and she's unemployed. I, I, I simply don't agree. Thank heaven she's a graduate. That makes it a bit better. Um, 11 out of 12, maybe I'll get there. Our schools are descended from industrial models of organisation. You know, the history of our schooling, particularly our secondary schooling, is essentially factory based. That's not a criticism of schools or teachers or people who work in them. Um, I still define myself in every way as a teacher. But we need to rethink it because actually they're built on a 19th century industrial template. Uh, and, and what we try and do is we try and personalise learning but with, with the sort of holding us back of that industrial template. Now, could we actually, what would schooling look like if we actually started with the individual and built up? I do think we need schooling. I do think we need math schooling. I do think the childcare function of schooling is important for those of us who are adults. Um, but let's actually embrace that rather than struggle with it. And let's ask if we weren't just taking a factory model and creating a schooling model, let's say, if we would take groups of individual learners with different needs, what would we build? I'm convinced that if we started again and invented schooling today, we'd invent something else. I don't know what it is, but there's enough people in the room to know what it is. And finally, just as a system principle, and this is the 12th, I don't know how many minutes have gone, but I'm gonna stop after this, right? We need to shift our focus from attainment first to inclusion first. Attainment first works 
when there's massive underperformance in the system. Yeah, and there was massive underperformance in the system when me and four of my mates got five A to C's, not 5% of us, five of us out of a year group of 150, right? In that kind of thing, you say, we've got to get attainment up. But actually, when we're arguing about whether a child does the 10th or 11th GCSE and other children are getting none, we've got the balance completely wrong. And we have to realize that to widen participation and bring in those learners for whom it's not working, we actually need to go inclusion first and let the attainment arise out of that. It's a slower burn, but it's more sustainable. It doesn't burn your profession out and it, it causes us to be more innovative in the way we go about it. So uh, those are my, uh, my 12 points. I would say, I think lockdown, for all the tragedy of it, has given us a system shock. And what we know about long-standing institutions, not the WEA, of course, but a lot of long-standing institutions, is that they reproduce themselves year on year. It's relatively recently that they stopped serving breakfast in hospitals at six o'clock in the morning. Why would you get people up at six o'clock in the morning if they're going to spend all day in bed? Well, the answer was because they always had. And then somehow that changed. Brilliant. This system shock may give us some opportunities to really think about what we, skill, what we need schooling to do. And it may have forced us to develop some of the skills we're so reluctant to. And, and I speak absolutely not as a digital native there, but as one struggle, who struggles every day with this stuff, as you can see this evening. My struggle has been with phones. I haven't got the computers yet. So I'm going to leave it there. Those are my 12 principles. I hope that's no more than seven minutes. I take the yellow card. I take the red card if it is. And I apologize. Thank you very much. Oh, Tom, thank you, Tony. Absolutely. You know, brilliant start. Thank you for that. Um, just, you know, some of those key messages about, you know, celebrating the social and community aspects of learning, learning to, you know, love learning again, you know, that the, the focus should be on inclu inclusion as much, if not more than attainment. So some really key messages there for us. For, for anybody that's struggling with the, the viewing settings on the on the call, if you hover top right of your screen, you'll see something that says view. And if you switch that to speak of you, um, you'll only be able to see the person speaking at that time because there is a, a, you know, a lot of us on the call. So if, if you just want to see the speaker, then switch to speak of you and, and that should help you. Thank you, Tony. Um, Thank you. I'm now delighted to be able to, to hand over to Katie. Katie Shaw, somebody I, you know, I met really early on um, in my tenure with, with WEA. Katie's an experienced campaign, a policy consultant. She's worked for the NUS, she's worked for Unison, um, and just all around, you know, top person, really. So, Katie, thank you for, you know, giving up your time for us, and, and the floor is yours. Oh, well, thank you, Simon. Um, I'm just going to do some reflection. I'll talk a little bit about my journey through um, post-compulsory education and then some reflections on kind of what lifelong learning means for millennials. So I graduated from university in 2005 with a humanities degree. Um, as a family, we didn't really know people who'd gone to university, so I didn't really have a lot of advice. My parents just understood that the point of going was to get a good job after and have doors opened. And that was what everyone else my age who didn't absolutely hate school was working towards. I was a really mediocre student, but a really enthusiastic activist. So after my degree, I worked for two years as an officer in my student's union. I then worked different minimum wage jobs while applying for career-based roles. And that was a process that took over two years before I secured my first salaried job. During this time, we had the 2008 financial crash, completely stalling the jobs market. And just like the economy, my mental health absolutely tanked. So to try to sort my head out, I enrolled at Plymouth College of Art on some textiles evening classes, um, alongside running a community knitting group in a pub. I was then offered a free place on a level three qualification where they were trialing, that they were trialing for people who wanted to start creative businesses. And the qualification gave me a real practical knowledge and support, learning with a group of people where I was by far the youngest. As the course ended, I got offered a full-time job, and then for almost a decade, a decade, I worked campaigning for conditions for young people. I worked on campaigning on the conditions that young people needed to support their education, paying absolutely no attention to my own. 2016 came and I had another mental health crash, so I enrolled at Westminster Adult Education Service for three terms of ceramic evening classes alongside work. 
The classes were quite mixed in terms of ages, but participants were mostly middle class professionals or retirees. But although cheaper than paying for therapy, my ceramics learning came to an end as I eventually ran out of place for all my sad pots. In 2018, I was working on the Union Learn project for Unison, and part of my role was promoting higher education to members. I paid off my 12 grand student loan the year before, age 30, 34, and wanted a new challenge. I thought about doing a master's for a few years, but there's no way I could afford the fees or take the break in, in education full time. Also, my undergrad definitely not my confidence academically, and the thought of going back to study was quite daunting. One of our union, union loan partners was Birkbeck, and they offered a part-time MSc in Education, Power and Social Change. So it's pretty much my ideal course, and it allowed, as it allowed me to think more critically about the area I was already working in. The classes were in the evening, 10 minutes walk from work, and not only did I get a fee discount as a trade union member, I also had access to another student loan. If it hadn't been for those factors, there's no way I would have been able to study. Choosing to study out of curiosity rather than expectation and learning alongside a group of adults from mixed backgrounds and mixed ages is probably one of the most empowering and affirmative, affirming choices I've ever made. The Learning and Work Institute's adult participation in learning data shows that group, the groups aged between 20 and 34 are generally the most likely to have access some kind of um, adult learning opportunity. So I did some really unscientific research and asked my friends why they've returned to education in their 20s and 30s. Pretty much everyone said they returned to education for either a career change or career progression. A small minority of them had employer support, either in time after study or funding support for qualifications, but these were mainly people in vocations already, such as teaching. For most, even when wanting to undertake learning to build their current careers, employers were reluctant to support them to learn. Other people responded saying they wouldn't have been able to study if it wasn't for NHS bursaries or other funding streams that were made available to them. Most people said that money and time were the biggest barriers to them returning to education. And we know that the cost of living is a really significant issue for millennials. Families can rarely survive on one income alone, childcare and rent is expensive, and finding funds for a house deposit is really tough. And on average, we're earning less weekly than workers were pre the 2008 crash. And alongside that, obviously, education costs have rocketed. It's hard to think about accessing education and lifelong learning without taking into account these external pressures and the ideologies associated with education that we've grown up under. So for my generation, enduring contemporary education policies and practices or feeling the pressure of the rise of the cost of living has meant that our relationship with education has become synonymous with employability. In Unison's Skills for the Future research, um, young workers were by far the highest group to identify a learning need. And those needs tended to focus around workplace skills like management and assertiveness. The drivers for undertaking adult education focused on career change, higher earnings and stability, rather than for the love of learning. Other friends talked about returning to education at different points in their lives, needing something positive after a major life change or finding the confidence to, to change careers. Very few people talked about learning for the sake of learning, but those that did talked about positive effects on their confidence and well-being. I think there's a lot of learning that goes on in my generation. It's just often informal, self-directed and takes place outside of providers. We also don't always see it as educational learning because it's not something that's being done to us. We're doing it for pleasure, whether it's podcasts, language apps, binge watching history documentaries or learning a new skill in a social setting. There's an appetite for lear to learn for pleasure, but it's often on people's own terms outside of what they associate with formal education. If we want to engender a love of lifelong learning for millennials, we've got a complicated task. We need accessible and essential provision that supports and sustains people in the labour market in a non-linear way, providing economic and social stability whilst addressing existing inequalities. But we also need to recognise the cumulative effects of socio-economic pressure outside of education that makes lifelong learner learning a luxury for so many of us. However, our biggest job is undoing the generational narrative that education and learning is about qualifications and that qualifications are about employment rather than education and learning being about joy and challenge and growth. Thanks. Well, thanks, Katie. Um, you know, just, you know, an absolute honest and personal, you know, view of that. And, and thank you for, for sharing that with us. Um, I, I can't imagine you having any sad pots in your house, only only happy pots, I'm sure. And and thank you for, for letting me know that um, my binge watching of Netflix is actually educational. So I'll take that, definitely. Thank you. 
Um, we're now handing over to Helen Hammond. Helen is the principal of, of WM College, you know, historically known as the Working Men's College. And Helen's been a, a great support to me, she, you know, as a fellow leader in an institute of adult education, great support to me since I, I started at the WEA and was teasing me just before we came onto this call. It's the first time she's seen me in a jacket and tie in six months. So thanks, Helen, and, and over to you. Hi, thank you all very much. I just wanted to give you a bit of an overview of uh, the, the kind of the, the learners in their 40s and 50s who at the Working Men's College that makes up 40% of our overall cohort. So it's a sizable group of learners. And obviously, you know, they're as different as each other. Uh, and yet I'm going to try and, and, and bring out some of the kind of similarities and some of the issues and some of the concerns that they have. Certainly um, at Working Men's, uh, this cohort has, has been our largest single cohort for a number of years. Um, it's very much split again in our kind of normal 75% female, 25% male kind of uh, uh, division. And because of where we are in Camden in North London, we are an incredibly diverse and incredibly mixed um, demographic and so that adds to, to the beauty of it but also adds to some of the the difficulties that we find one of the things that I think comes over very much about this group is as I say it's a predominantly female group and there are all sorts of issues that are often cultural because of the cultural backgrounds that our learners come from about whether these women should be engaging with learning in the first place you know that they've kind of stepped out of the cultural perception of you know being the mother at home and looking after the family and all those sorts of things so there's a, a whole kind of range of issues that go around that and I think the other issue that is very clear amongst this group uh, is as you know we've seen them re referred to in that awful kind of way as the kind of the sandwich generation they tend to be the generation that have children, often teenagers, but they're also having responsibility for looking after their own parents. So there's an awful lot of pressures on this group from, from all sorts of things. We used to find, when I was looking at the demographics for this, we used to find that about three years ago, the bulk of learners in this area were working, were, were following um, non-accredited learning. Uh, a lot of them in the arts and crafts, the dressmaking, the uh, clothes making, those sorts of areas. But it's quite interesting to look that from um, 18 to 19, 2018 to 2019, there's been a complete shift in amongst the, the courses that these group, that these age groups are looking at. We certainly have a very large um, ESL ESOL um, need and certainly uh, as a cohort this group uh, there's a, a huge amount of them who are doing ESOL English and maths classes. The other thing that has become more apparent and it, it's quite interesting because obviously it's going to become an even bigger issue post-COVID and with employment well employment unemployment issues and all the rest of it but certainly over the last two years, there's been quite a move amongst people towards employment facing courses. Um, and one of the issues that we sort of grapple with is the need, or if you like the demand of many employers that they want English and maths GCSEs as a basic you know, entry point for, for adult learners. And for many adult learners, these are completely the wrong entry points. Uh, we obviously offer functional skills, which are better, but they're not brilliant, but they are much better. But they, again, I think that mismatch between what employers want or what they're told is what they want uh, is difficult. And I think, you know, one of the things that's been touched on already uh, by Tony, but this idea of, you know, a qualification, a piece of paper being the be all and end all, it, it's quite difficult 
because then when employers are saying that is what they're wanting and expecting, you know, we're trying to, to kind of deal with that. Uh, so there are significant um, issues looking at how we can help and support these learners. One of the things that we have found overwhelmingly is the need for us to be incredibly flexible in how we offer the courses, how we package up the courses, how we deal with uh, attendance, all those sorts of things. And in a real kind of ironic way, lockdown has actually helped us to an extent with that because we can now, and we have obviously moved to a lot more blended learning, a lot more online learning, a lot more, you know, you name it learning, we do it. <laughs> Every way, shape and form learning, we'll do it. Uh, and it really helps for this cohort because you know where there are incredible pressures from the family, from the fact that many of them are obviously working part-time, often sort of under the radar type work part-time. Um, we need to be able to be flexible that if you know, the normal route for many of our learners is they come to us for a couple of years to improve their ESOL skills and then they move on to a more formal qualification. Uh, and so it does take a number of years. So we have to be able to let people kind of dip in and out. We have to be able to, for them to do some of the work remotely. Uh, and obviously, you know, by moving to a more blended pattern, that is certainly helping significantly. I think the last sort of point that I want to make about this group is that obviously we all know that, you know, or at least we all know we're being told we're living longer. It sounds a bit odd in amongst all this COVID, but you know, we all know the thing about um, aging and having to reskill and all these issues. But you know, for many of these learners that I'm talking about, they're not reskilling, they're skilling for the first time. And that is an incredible pressure. And I am extremely worried as to what will happen with the employment for people in this age group, because I think there's, there's obviously going to be a huge swathe of younger people coming forward looking for work who will be cheaper to employ than people in their 40s who maybe have not worked in that way before. And I think that's a major issue that we as educational professionals have to engage with about how we help and prepare people and kind of fight the corner for them. So I'll leave it there for the moment, Simon. Thanks, Helen. You know, absolutely fantastic. You, you're right that and we'll, I think we'll return to this sort of question in, um, and debate in the Q&As, this focus on skills and qualifications versus vocational learning and, and really learning that addresses those cultural or gender issues that you were, you were flagging. So, you know, thank you for that. I'm going to quickly hand us on to, to Dr. Emily Andrews. Emily is the Senior Evidence Manager at the Centre for Aging Better, you know, a really great organisation for those of you who may not have come across the Centre for Aging Better. I'd, I'd ask you to take, take a look on their website, some really, really good resources there. So Emily, over to you. Thanks very much. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen. I have a few slides, but I promise this won't be death by PowerPoint because we've had such wonderful personal reflection so far so i'll just start there okay um holler if you can't see my slides but i will just go and also uh holler if i'm starting to go over okay so uh yes i'm from the center for aging better we're a charity um that works to create a society where everyone gets to enjoy their later life um, with the Centre for Eight, we're funded by an endowment for the National Lottery Community Fund, and with the Centre for Aging Better rather than the Centre for, for Being Older, uh, and we focus specifically on interventions that can take place when we're in our 50s and 60s or changes that can happen in our 50s and 60s in order to set us up for later life. Uh, we uh, and one of the key uh, areas that we work on is fulfilling work and making sure that we all have access to fulfilling work. Uh, into our 50s and up to 69 is where we really focus and, and slightly differently from our previous speakers uh, I'm, a, I'm a kind of stats person by trade and I think what I'm going to be doing is talking about work and employment more and really making the case for why particularly employment focused learning 
um, if for people in their 50s and 60s is really important right now in light of the current crisis. Um, and I was reminded again of why this is so important. I saw a tweet today, someone repeating the old tune from lockdown one, uh, that uh, we are destroying the economic prospects of the young in order to protect the health of the old, which rather ignores the fact that a third of our workforce is aged 50 or older, and that just last month the state pension age reached 66. So particularly the, at the end of the older worker cohort, by older workers we actually mean people in midlife, people in their 50s and, and 60s, people particularly at the latter end of their workforce, are facing right now a double jeopardy of both health um, and, uh, and employment. So I'm going to summarise my argument and then I'm going to start to unpack it. But if during that unpacking, I reach the end of my time, Simon, do feel free to uh, uh, shut me up. OK, so in brief, the emerging picture of the labour market post COVID is that we're heading towards a surge in long term unemployment around the over 50s. So in terms of the kind of hit of uh, job uh, losses um, as a result of this crisis, as far as we can tell at the moment, um, that's uh, going to, uh, obviously this is all shifting, but people in their 50s and 60s are likely to be the second hardest hit group, if you can think of it in that way, by job losses. So the youngest are going to kind of probably lose jobs at the, at the greatest rate, but then uh, people in their 50s, particularly in their 60s, are then uh, the second most at risk. Um, but what we're really worried about is that uh, those in their age group who do lose their job are likely to struggle the most to return to work and are at greatest risk of long-term unemployment. That's why they might not lose the job in such great numbers as people in the, at the kind of beginning um, of their kind of working lives. They're at the risk, a real risk of not returning to work and there's a multitude of issues for that. Um, partly it's because the 50 plus cohort has been consistently failed by back to work support um, and it's we're at quite an urgent place now where job seekers who might have spent many decades, sorry, or workers who are now job seekers, you might have spent many decades working in one of the sectors which is now contracting in this COVID world, are really going to need support to retrain. And I, and I also hope we'll all join our call to government to provide targeted, tailored support for people over 50, uh, who, which recognises that a 60 year old has very valid needs, which are very different to the needs um, of someone in their uh, 30s uh, when it comes to returning to work. So uh, the kind of the, the bedrock of evidence on which I make those claims comes from this report, which is on this slide here, a midlife employment crisis, which is something that the Learning and Work Institute did for and with us. Um, but obviously the situation has kind of moved on a bit since then. Um, so, I mean, too early to tell much from high level employment stats, we are worried about people writing themselves off out of the uh, jobs market. So economic inactivity, I'm doing such a Chris Whitty here, but anyway, uh, in terms of just putting a load of data on the slide, but uh, economic inactivity rates uh, might be going up a little bit in this age group. Um, but there's other evidence, for example, some analysis that the IFS did suggest that 5% of people aged 50 plus who said they plan to retire, have said that they plan to retire earlier now than they did pre-COVID. Now, 5% isn't, isn't huge, but that is quite a lot of people. And it is, it, that percentage is greater among people who are furloughed. So there's a, a concern there that there's people who have been furloughed who are now older and kind of feeling uh, less uh, uh, feeling pessimistic about their op opportunities for the future so we are worried about that and you know even people who have plenty of money to um, support themselves in retirement it might not be uh, ultimately what's best for their well-being. Um, furlough rates here we can see the kind of u-shape in furlough rates this is there's a different data sources for this this one is drawn from the ONS labour force survey from April to June showing that people the older workers were again you've got that high gradient of people on Furlough, of course, once you get past 65, the actual numbers of people is quite small, but kind of 50 to 65, that's a big chunk of our workforce uh, uh, being on furlough. And interestingly, there was some analysis uh, from uh, the Resolution Foundation a couple of weeks ago, um, which showed that if you look here, you can see that the 55 to 64s who were put on furlough in March to June were the most likely to still be on furlough in September. Uh, even though they weren't the most likely to have lost their job. So just a, a kind of a little warning sign there. 
And that's in terms of kind of job losses. But like I say, what we're really worried about is long term unemployment. Pre COVID, a third of unemployed people age 50 plus have been unemployed for more than 12 months, nearly a third. Um, more than any other age group. Also, re-employment rates and after redundancy, that's whether you've got a job afterwards, tend to be lower. Uh, after redundancy within three months, tend to be lower among this age group. You can see 35% among the 50 plus, compared to just over half of people age 35 to 49 gaining a job three months after redundancy. Um, and why is that? I suppose that's the really interesting question. Qualitative evidence suggests that the barriers include skills in actually being knowing how to find a job. The process of job searching and job application has changed a huge amount in recent decades. You know, you no longer physically, even pre-lockdown, of course, physically walk into somewhere and hand someone a CV. Things are now much more online uh, and uh, both application and job search. And if you haven't searched for a job in 20 years, you're going to need some to support to navigate that. There's, of course, developing actual skills. Uh, to transition to new sectors pre-COVID. Flexibility is key for this cohort. And of course, there's ageism, both internalised and externalised ageism. So we have one person who said that people see us as older than we are. They see us at risk in the same way that over 70s are at risk. So that kind of narrative of vulnerability is seeping down, kind of seeping down the age ranges. And then, of course, there's this issue of confidence aspirations, which in itself is internalised ageism. Do we feel that we are as entitled to work and support after uh, 50, particularly after 60, um, which is, I think, kind of like the big, the big at-risk group here. Um, so that's me. What should be done? Clear message that people are entitled to support. Targeted, individualised support for uh, workers over 50, which don't <laughs> fail in the way that previous... Uh, programs have and we have a long list of things that can be done to change and we're also testing those out now robust standards so that service providers aren't allowed to park over 50s because they're harder and of course using a portion of funds not yet committed to the national skills fund in a restart scheme for people who are at the later ages of their employment journey and particularly there's an opportunity around kickstart to make the most of people who have experience um, okay that's me thank you well, thanks, Emily. A, a, a lot packed in there and good timekeeping. Thank you. And and you, you're right, just dispelling that myth that somehow this is just about younger workers being being impacted, um, massive impact on older workers. And and that really important um, message that you've left us with that that the journey back into employment for older workers is is a very different and perhaps more complex one than than younger workers as well. So so thanks for highlighting that. I'm going to move on now and introduce Sue Craggs. Sue is um, Head of Adult and Community Education at the Mary Ward Centre. Mary Ward Centre is another one of the, the Institutes of Adult Learning based in London. So thanks for taking the time to join us, Sue, and, and over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, and thank you for inviting me um, to speak. Um, it's great to see you all um, on this quite bright but cold afternoon. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about um, the, the other end of the spectrum, if you like, the kind of over 60s um, spectrum and what we do at Mary Ward to support and um, offer opportunities um, for those learners. We have at Mary Ward Centre over 40% of our um, students are over 60 and 20, 16, sorry, 20%, 16 to 20% are actually between 70 and 90 plus. Um, of course, all of those people engage in activities across all of our, um, all of our programs, but we also have um, a discrete program um, for the over 60s which is designed to um, engage with people at a, with a pace of learning that suits them to provide companionship to with a kind of um, the sort of mantra of healthy mind, healthy body, healthy brain. Um, and there's a number of activities that ha happen within that discrete programme. And they include um, things like keep fit, 
fitness in retirement, extra gentle Pilates, um, art, art, arts and crafts. We have a singing um, group. Um, there's a writing in retirement um, class that people um, um, engage with. And there's some, some um, discussion group with a uh, debate in society um, where they meet once a week and then once a month they have an open debate where they invite other people from um, the rest of the, the centre. There's also a, a group that meet once a week that's a much more kind of gentle and social group in order to support people with isolation and loneliness. They have visiting speakers. Um, it's very much a student-led group where they will um, they decide on what the program is, they decide on their speakers, they, for instance, invite speakers from the police to talk to them about safety, they'll ask for um, a speaker from one of the members of staff to come and talk to them for, um, to tell them about internet safety, for instance, which is quite a hot topic at, at the minute. Um, or somebody from the fire department, they have people talking to them about wills and that kind of thing. So it's very much student led. They also um, give sort of talks themselves to each other. So whatever areas of interest they have, they share their, their experiences and knowledge with each other. Um, and there's a couple of groups that are volunteer led um, that, that, that happen. One of which is a, a line dancing group who meet every week um, and uh, perform every, every year at the Queen Square Fair. Um, and they're fantastic. I think what, what's been important, for, what's important for them is that this is their, their opportunity to engage with other people. It helps with loneliness, their, um, their isolation, this is an opportunity for them to meet up with other, other people that they don't, they don't um, often get. Um, and one of the things that they talk to me about a lot is that that idea of healthy body, healthy mind, healthy brain, they absolutely can tell me that they, um, their health is particularly um, improved because of coming to the college and coming to uh, classes whether that's their balance and that they or whether that's their um, pain management of arthritis or whether that's um, to keep them feeling kind of please you know sort of pleased about themselves their confidence um, and I see that and anybody who would say to me um, that singing class isn't really, you know, it's not really learning. I, I've stood there and, and watched them perform and they are confident in being able to sing solo. They are remembering all the words and um, music. They can um, perform together. They're in harmony, harmony with each other. And it's fantastic to watch that. One of the things that uh, has happened because of coronavirus and COVID and lockdown, is they were devastated that they couldn't come to class. That that cohort of learners was absolutely um, devastated that that they that we'd closed and we we they couldn't come along. Um, and as soon as we were able to open again, they're one of the groups who were really keen to come back. Um, and going into a second lockdown, um, they are the group that are very um, vociferous about the fact that we are able to now stay open. And this is what they, they, want, they want to continue to come. This is the only form of interaction that some, some people have with other, other humans. Um, it's, they talk about this as their lifeline. Um, they talk about this as their family. Um, and they certainly, they talk to me about the benefits to their health and 
in the last couple of weeks since September when, when we came back, they've talked about how their health has suffered during that period of um, lockdown and not being able to come to class. Although some of some um, activities we've put online um, using Zoom, they although they're not necessarily not able to do that, they don't want to. They want to have that interaction with with other people, and I think it's really important that that we we understand the benefit of that for those um, this this set of learners, um, and we're able to continue to to offer them opportunities to, to come and to engage with, with um, other people and to continue their learning and to continue to share their own experiences not, and knowledge with, with, with others. So that's the Mary Ward Centre. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Sue. And, and you know, thanks a lot for that. And just that, that notion of, of student-led learning you know, and, and whether that should just, you know, it's, it's great that it's there in your cohort, but, you know, I think, again, that's something that could span lifelong learning. How do we how do we support students to to direct their own learning? And again, that sense that there's learning in everything, you know, what you, you know, what, how, who are we to judge, you know, what those outcomes are for people. So thank you. Thank you for that. There's now going to be, we're going to take, we've got about 20 minutes, I think, right? You know, so yeah, 15, 20 minutes for, for questions. I'm going to try, Chris is looking at the chat and he's going to try and um, pull together some questions, some common threads from that. But I thought I'd just start by by asking each of our panelists um, just for a, for a quick comment, maybe in the order at which they spoke. So I'll probably come to Tony first, if that's all right. Just quick, quick reflections on, on this as a sort of question stroke topic, we've heard you know, quite, quite a lot in the discussions that m much of the current government focus and policy is on workplace skills. So what, how do you think that affects the different cohort and age groups of learners that each of you have spoken to, either positively, negatively, or you know, you know, your, your reflections on whether this focus on workplace skills is, is, is good or not? Tony, can I come to you first? And you may need to take yourself off mute, I think, Tony. How's that? Yeah. That's um, perfect. I think the problem with the education employment contract that's kind of pervaded our educational thinking for so long, and it's obvious why, because, you know, for so long, the way we've earned our living, the way we've supported our families, lived our lives, has been through earning, has been through employment. The reality is that it's not going to be quite as simple as that in the future. Um, you know, the notions of lifelong careers, for instance, with a few exceptions, essentially rapidly becoming an historical concept. So, you know, you we have to prepare young people and we have to prepare learners very different to scale a, career, a multiple career scaffolding than climb a single career ladder. Uh, and I don't, I think to, in, to some degree, there's a, for me, the big tension in how we get beyond lockdown is we need to think about what we can't wait to get back to, but we also need to think about what we can't wait to leave behind. And we need to say, what, what, you know, how much more successful would all of us be in working in adult and lifelong learning if actually young people and indeed older people, but people coming through our school system, et cetera, would have a different experience of learning to start yes. with. And Mike, can we find a way of keeping some of that joy of the, yeah. the year three kid running in? Um, and I do think that I, I'm, I'm optimistic about that. I genuinely believe we can, but I think a lot of the time when we're working in adult ed, we feel almost as if we've got to undo a lot of stuff before we can redo stuff. And just yeah. one other thing on the employment link. I think it leads us to a false instrumentalism. The most important thing, if you want employability, engagement, social inclusion, is to get people involved in learning. The idea that you only put them onto a certain kind of vocational course, because actually the country needs people who can do X and therefore we've got one of those courses this week, is so wrong-headed 
what you do is to get them into any kind of learning that works for them and you get them onto the vocational stuff after they've got confident with re-establishing themselves as a learner and for many school will be a long time behind them and for many it won't have been a great experience so yeah. actually it's a complete you know it might be that the sewing classes and the flower arranging are ultimately far more successful at building people's employability than the, and I'm not trying to put one against the other, but a, a level something in some technical skill, because that's where the market says the gap is. And I just think we need to, to be, you know, more open in our thinking on that. And more importantly, we've got to get the policy shapers and the policy makers in the room. We've got to get them to think of that. Um, yeah. We've got a big Thanks, job with some of them. Yeah, no, th thanks, Tony. That's that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, Katie, any any reflections? You touched on it in your your piece. Just quick quick reflections on this this debate. Yeah, I think um, for my sort of generation growing up under very much under neoliberal like education policies, like that relationship with education has become synonymous with employability, and I think that kind of constant testing and that kind of I guess production line version of education that we've come out and and people have uh, you know we have you go to university not to kind of explore things and be critical but you go because at 21 you want to come out and enter the job market and you know that's important but like also there's a lot learning in itself like we, we run the risk I think of, of losing like the, the joy of education for people that have, have very recently gone through our education system and I think that's going to really hinder people returning to education at, at later life. Yeah, thank, thanks, Katie. And, it, and it's shining through, isn't it? This this love of learning, joy of education for education's sake. So, you know, thank you for that. Helen, any, any quick reflections from your point of view? Just to say, I completely, obviously agree with, you know, the whole thing about love of learning. I wouldn't have spent nearly 40 years in adult ed if I didn't. But we've also got to be practical. People have got to get jobs. People have got to live. People have got to kind of develop. And certainly in working with my um, learners, it's very much about it. It's very much about the, you know, everything that is included in going to work. And for a lot of adults who haven't been in the workforce or have kind of been working in the black market under the radar, there's a whole kind of piece of work that we do that's all the sort of the confidence building, the supporting of them, all the kind of stuff that wraps around a formal qualification. And I think yeah. the only other point I would say, which is the one that's most difficult to change, is helping, is, is, is from the employer side. They kind of don't know what it is that they want. Mm. And yeah. so they're told, you need a math GCSE or you need an English. So they don't quite know what to ask for as well. And so it would be really good if there was some way we could engage with that perhaps more than we have before. Mm. Yeah, no, great point, Helen. That two-way, that two-way flow, and um, yeah, I think you are make a, a, a comment on that later, Emily. That you know, segue into you, maybe a slightly different view. Like you say, is that there's room for both in this? Is there? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm quite an employment focused in my kind of lens on these issues. But one piece of work that we've done, if anyone's heard of the midlife MOTs, right? Yeah. And and you might hate them because you might have heard of them as like this thing that you know they sit you down and make you think about your pension when you're in your 50s and unfortunately that is how some of these are, these are being implemented but I think the research that we've done is around taking these that idea of a kind of course of a kind of of a, of a kind of few day reflective course um, uh, um, kind of um, within an employment setting although it could happen in other settings where people in their kind of fifth kind of early 50s kind of or, or early to mid 50s kind of like when you're kind of approaching that thing looking forward to that next stage of your life are given a space to reflect on what you want to do with that time and you know what's in you know what's in front of you and and there's practical elements of that around thinking about your skills thinking about what training you might need thinking about your financial position but what we found is that the key to making these things successful was that they they provide psychosocial support a yep. space and exactly as Helen was saying a space to kind of reflect a kind of a safe place to actually think about your life in the round no one ever really sits you down once you, you know 
you know, once you get past, you know, way before 50, people don't like really sit down with you and say, what do you want to do and how do you want to go about it? So I think there's something in there that is a vehicle potentially for kind of opening up some of these pathways um, to around learning and employment. Yeah, no, thanks, Emily. That's, that's great. And Sue, any, any reflections? I mean, I agree with with everything that's just been said. I think for for the the age range or the the students that I've been talking about, it's it's that wider benefit of learning. Um, and the the fund, uh, my worry is or concern is that the funding is quite narrow, and where the additional funding is is quite narrow, and therefore. In order, to, for, in order to provide um, opportunities for, for people to benefit from the, the kind of wider health benefits um, of, of learning is that our money just has to stretch further every time and, and every year and you've just got more people and, and less for it to go around sort of thing. Our over 60s um, provision is heavily subsidised, um, even more so than the um, concessionary fee. And we're missing that wider benefit. So it's, I think education has become quite um, sort of, you know, it's a means to an end. Um, it's a bit like we've been saying, it's a means to get a job. And, um, you know, it, it's much more than that. Um, yeah. And, and that's what I think we've got to try and kind of encapsulate in in the um, in the in, in the funding um, criteria. And you know we are saving money in other areas for other areas of government departments. Yeah. In the NHS, if my students are telling me that you know their balance is much improved, they're not um, having to rely on pain you know drugs in order to manage their pain relief because their Tai Chi class is so fantastic. We, we need a bit more joined upness and uh, around that. And, and we, all, we all know that those benefits. Um, yeah. I'm not sure why it so, seems so difficult to, to join that up in, in, in a way. No, thank, thanks, Sue. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to Chris in, in a moment just um, to see if there's any common themes coming through the chat sort of that audience sort of questions piece and, and I'll ask panellists just to shout out if it's a if it's a question that you think you, you're best placed to answer. Just that little bit of chair's prerogative. I think I'm quite, you know, I'm interested as uh, with the WEA and, and, I'm, and I'm ambitious about how we how we can do both, how we can actually influence employers and, and win the argument that, you know, the that very narrow definition of skills isn't actually helping helping them, you know, um, recruit the type of workforce they need, but not at the expense of our vocational learning as well. And I think if we if we carry on setting them up as as somehow in in opposition yeah. to each other, yeah. I think I think we'll struggle. So I think it's it's incumbent on all of us to try and you know get a much more rounded approach. You know, win the argument through almost being able to to play both sides of of the fence, if you like. So Chris, is there any any common themes coming coming through the chat that you, you'd want to point out for the panel? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, there's some extraordinarily good stuff on the chat. It's almost like a kind of parallel conference happening alongside. It's really rich stuff. So thank you to all the contributors. Just aware of the time, and we also want to leave a little bit of time for Learning and Work Institute at the end. Um, if I was to, and this is almost impossible, but if I was going to pull out one thing that seems to come through all of it. Now, of course, We've arranged the program around age groups, you know, almost sort of uh, as a kind of deliberately provocative thing. But of course, a lot of people are asking, well, you know, a lot of what they've heard and a lot of what they're commenting on really ageism is at the bottom of it. You know, either sort of, uh, you, you know, people making assumptions about younger people or people making assumptions about older people not being in the workplace or whatever. So, I think if we were going to come back to the panel for some last reflections, I wonder if there's something about um, how do we combat ageism in learning, in society generally, and are there any good examples of intergenerational working which might uh, might help us do that? Thanks, Chris. So, so I just throw it over to the the panel. Yeah, really great point. You know that are we are we setting it, this up as you know some courses for young people, other courses for old people. You know. And, and as Chris says, is it not much more compl complex than that and, and intergenerational? So anybody want, anybody from the panel want first stab? Yeah. Go on, Helen. No, I'll come in with that because obviously, although I've spoken about 
the uh, learners in the 40s and 50s, they obviously are integrated across the college in a whole range of different classes with different age groups. You know, as a cohort, there are larger single cohort, but they do obviously cut across uh, and work with other people. And I think that's really important. And one thing uh, we, we're obviously adult education, but the one group where we have 18 and 19 year olds is we run a foundation art diploma. Uh, and we found that's really interesting because to have a younger cohort of about 50, 18, 19 year olds mixing in, you know, in the coffee, in the coffee rooms, you know, talking yeah. to people, that, that is really important. And you almost can't make that happen, but just by being in the building, which obviously we're not properly at the moment, but you know, by, by kind of cutting across and doing that, it's quite interesting because I get learners from each side saying, oh, it's quite nice seeing, you know, yeah. this person and that person. So yeah, but it's a huge topic. I mean, we can't, we can't do um, justice to it now, but I'll, I'll shut up for the moment. <laughs> No, thank you. Not at all, Helen. And you're right. If it, you know, one of the you know very limited sort of benefits of of maybe moving it all online is we've seen we've seen much more mixed sort of groups in terms of age profiles across across our courses up and down the country. You know, from from the first lockdown onwards. So, and any of the other panelists, you know, desperate to come in on this one? Yeah. Um, oh, do you want to go? Go with, no, no, we'll take Katie. We'll take Katie and then Tony. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think one of um one of the, like the very few silver linings of kind of what's happening at the minute is is kind of this like rebuilding of social solidarity, and we're seeing that kind of intergenerationally. And I think through particularly through the establishment of mutual aid networks and communities responding like directly to the pandemic, it's not just kind of going getting people shopping and uh, picking up prescriptions. Like I've seen examples where that there is like cross community learning going on, like communities are growing things together. People are sharing resources, learning how to do DIY. And I think that kind of like reinforcing kind of that aspect of social solidarity is one of the things that's gonna really sort of help kind of work across different age groups. Um, and yeah, yeah, I just think the pandemic, there's some brilliant examples of it kicking around. Yeah, no, th thanks Katie. That's that aspect of that societal recovery and we can, we can build this back better. You know, I know it's the slogan at the moment, but you know, we're seeing that, you know, in these communities up and down up and down the country. Tony, did you want the last yeah, go well, at this? I, I just think that, that in terms of the, uh, the pandemic and schooling, the whole home learning thing and the whole way in which schools, many schools have built a new relationship with parents. And it certainly hasn't worked for every parent. It certainly hasn't worked for every school or every class, but there's some really exciting examples. And it strikes me that one thing we underuse the capacity of is intergenerational family learning to raise achievement in, mm -hmm. amongst disadvantaged children. And I mm -hmm. think that there's a kind of whole closing the gap opportunity there that we just miss. And maybe there's a kind of, in some cases, there are new school home relationships and new family learning possibilities that are emerging. And we yes. need to kind of capture those and, and see if we can do something with them. Yeah, that, that really strong point to finish on there, Tony. You're right. We've, we, we have got to capture whatever positives have come out of this. And I know they're few and far between, but let's let's hold on to, to any of those good bits. If I may, I just want to move us on so that we, we can finish roughly on, on time. And I'm going to ask um, Sarah Park. Sarah's a project manager with um, Age UK on a one digital um, projects and Sarah I know you will have been listening intently have you any reflections from your point of view on on what you think you've heard this afternoon hi yeah um really fantastic discussion it's so interesting um especially because I work at HUK now but I used to work at a national youth charity so I've got both elements in my head as well um but yeah I mean I manage our digital inclusion services um, at Age UK, so one digital among, amongst other programmes. Um, so my focus is really on, especially now with COVID, all of the learning opportunities moving online. Um, there are fantastic resources and, and all of these opportunities, but for those older people who aren't, aren't online, um, don't have access to technology or don't have the skills or confidence, it's, it's much harder to access those opportunities um, and make the most of them. Um, so I guess the first step for me in, in my role is the importance of that digital skills, um, digital skills learning for the workplace. We're seeing lots of younger, older people come forward to Age UK who maybe wouldn't have come forward to us otherwise um, to seek support for reskilling, re-upskilling for work. 
um, and also for staying in touch with friends and family, but the importance of learning those digital skills in order to then engage in further learning opportunities. I think it's that, it's that stepping stone, isn't it? Um, and then I think the other point I just make is that um, in terms of lifelong learning and, and well-being as well. So uh, we want to understand lots more about this. So, so we've done quite a bit of research and um, we have got a uh, kind of well-being index, mm. um, which tr tries to um, construct, it summarizes kind of multiple perspectives, which contribute to the outcome um, of interest, well-being and later life. Um, and in, included in those indicators are kind of level of education and creative and cultural participation as well. Um, and both of those have quite a significant positive impact on an individual's well-being. Um, so we know that learning in older age contributes to the well-being of an individual um, and that older people need to continue to seek and engage in learning, but that we need to be able to be making it available and accessible to them. Um, and I would just signpost people to, we've got a policy position on our website um, and also the wellbeing index report, which has a bit more information about how it impacts the wellbeing as well. Excellent. Thank, thanks, Sarah. And, and that, that whole area of, of digital skills and digital inclusion is one that I, I probably want to wrap up on as well. So thank you for, for introducing that for us as well. I'm going to quickly move on to, to Emily Jones, who's the um, head of research at the Learning and Work Institute. And, and it's right that we, you know, we finish with a representative from Learning and Work Institute, because as I said at the beginning, what a great job, you know, Emily, you and the team have done to, to pull together a week long programme of events. So I know you want to talk about the participation survey and then I'll just come back and, and wrap up. So, so Emily, over to you. Great. Thank you, Simon. And thank you for inviting me to give a response to the really interesting perspectives that we've heard today on learning throughout life. And thank you to the WEA for running this webinar during our first lifelong learning week. Every year at Learning and Work Institute, we run the adult participation in learning survey, and this provides a unique, and rich um, evidence base on patterns and trends in adult learning across the UK um, and spans um, uh, the last 20 years. The survey adopts a broad definition of learning, so it's not limited to courses or learning that leads to a qualification. It includes learning that we do at home, at work, with our families um, and on our own. And each year, 5,000 adults who are representative of the population as a whole are asked whether they're currently learning or they've done some learning in the last three years. And this therefore tells us something about whether adults see themselves as learners. And this is important if we want to create a culture of lifelong learning. The survey series shows us that engagement in learning is not evenly spread across the population. So those who say they're learning are more likely to be young, in work, from higher social grades and with more years of initial education. So it's really important, as we've done today, to consider the uh, different needs and interests that people have. Um, and as we've heard from Helen and Sue, motivations include leisure, work, keeping fit and staying socially connected. As has already been reflected today, the pandemic has had a massive impact on our lives with many uh, millions of us working from home or um, people who've been furloughed, parents who've been homeschooling children. Adult um, learning providers have also been delivering learning online rather than in person. So we wanted to use the 2020 survey to understand whether people use this time at home for learning. And the survey showed that 43% of adults embrace this opportunity to learn uh, during lockdown. And this might reflect some of the reduced barriers to learning associated with time pressures, but also the convenience um, of online learning. But the pandemic may have also increased the value that adults place on learning for both work and their wider lives. And we know that this is really important, that we not only remove barriers to learning, but we also increase the value that adults place on learning. However, we do see the same patterns of inequality when looking at who took up learning in lockdown. So younger adults, full-time workers, those in higher socioeconomic grades were all more likely to be learning. And when we look at full-time employees, those who continued to work during lockdown were more likely to have done some learning than those who were furloughed. So these long-standing inequalities tell us that there are groups within the population 
who perhaps think that learning isn't for them. And we need to think about how we tackle these inequalities, how we get people to think of learning that something's for them and something they can do. Now, the good news is, um, is that learning is addictive. So the survey shows that once we get adults into learning, they, they say they're more likely to continue. So to create a culture of lifelong learning, as we've been talking about today, we need to inspire people to have a go. And earlier this week, we announced our Festival of Learning Award winners. So these are adult learners, tutors, projects and employers who help us recognise that learning is transformational. It's exciting, it's rewarding um, and it's possible at any age and for any reason. Um, and it's really important that we share these stories um, and, and those that we've heard today, like Katie's experiences, as they do a much better job than any survey at demonstrating the difference that learning can make. So thank you again for a great event, and I hope you've all enjoyed and will continue to enjoy Lifelong Learning Week. Just to say that nominations for next year's Festival of Learning Awards launch tomorrow. So have a think and please do nominate any individuals or organisations that you've been inspired by. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, absolutely fantastic sort of close there for us. Thank you. And and um, I think it's in the chat as well. Yeah, you know, I did I'd encourage everybody. You know, so many, you know, inspiring practitioners, students, tutors out there. So if you know those people, you know, get them nominated. The WEA will be sponsoring an award again next year with with Learning and Work Institute. So, you know, thank you and, and well done again, Emily. A great, a great week. I just want to finally wrap up then, and we, we're sort of nearly on time. We're just overrunning slightly. So I hope you'll forgive us for that because I think it's been, you know, a really, really strong and interesting session. And we're recording the session. We will make the session available um, through that recording. And I'm probably putting Chris on the spot, but we will try and, and capture all the chat um, messages that we've had as well and try and find a way of feeding those back because as Chris mentioned there's there's lots and lots of interesting contributions there as well. I wanted to close by saying that you know if you've enjoyed this session you know you've been able to enjoy it because you know you've got access to the equipment and you've got access to the connectivity that, that you need to learn online and have that love of learning and, and that joyful learning experience. But actually not everybody's in that position. So at the WEA, what we've done is create a digital lifeline campaign, fundraising campaign. All the money that we, we raise through that campaign is going directly to fund equipment for, for learners or connectivity for learners. So making sure they can access the laptops and the tablets that they need, making sure that they're not having to make choices between feeding the gas and electric meter or buying extra data. So if you've enjoyed this session and you're in a position to give any amount of money, please visit our website, look at that digital lifeline learning campaign and, and give if you can. So thank you. Thanks for spending the afternoon with us. Thanks for all the contributions, which you know I really do feel have shown us that there is a real love for learning you know, across a wide sort of section of the population. And it's our job, every single one of us, to keep banging the drum and say and make everybody understand that lifelong learning is a vital part of the recovery that we all want to see. So thank you and have a good afternoon. Thank you.